Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Thursday Garden Chat, the weekly public service broadcast of Garden Masterclass. Um, well, I'll just start off with running through uh, what we've got uh, coming up um, over the next few weeks. Um, so we've got two more webinars in the next few weeks, and then one more webinar in May, and then that will be it then for the summer. Uh, next week, we've got uh, Salvia with Frank Fisher. Uh, Salvia is one of the really largest and most complex uh, ornamental plant genera uh, with an extraordinary color range. Uh, and over the last couple of decades, really, a lot of Salvias, particularly South American ones have become uh, very popular garden plants. Uh, the presenter is a chap called Frank Fisher, who I met at a conference in Spain back in October at the Culti Delta conference. Um, and his nursery is actually in the Black Forest. Uh, so it's not particularly balmy climate. And what I liked about his presentation was the real focus on the one hand, uh, drought tolerant species, and on the other hand, hardy ones. Um, so that should be quite a kind of a, a well grounded presentation next uh, next week. And the week after that, on the 15th, we've got uh, Cassian Schmidt uh, talking about dry habitats as a uh, reference for uh, dry situations in the garden. Uh, Cassian is deservedly one of our most popular presenters, uh, a man with an enormous range of, of knowledge and experience uh, and uh, always backed up by some uh, stunning photography as, as, as well. Um, and then on the 1st of May, we uh, kick off again with live events um, in, in, in Britain at any rate. Annie is doing her garden model making workshop at Yo Valley Garden in Somerset. Um, the 3rd of May, we've got Jason Ingram running a garden and plant photography masterclass at Case and House near Bath, which is somewhere which we're a new venue we're very keen on. Um, and then I'll also just flag up at the moment, uh, the reason, uh, well, Annie is uh, not with us today because she's uh, just finishing off uh, doing a garden tour at White House Farm in Kent. This is going to be the first of, of three uh, tours of this remarkable private uh, arboretum and, and plant collection. Uh, and indeed, uh, our Thursday Garden Chat last week was an interview with Morris Foster, who's built this collection up over over his over his life. So, um, that if you uh, if you're in that part of the world and you couldn't go today, then hopefully you might be able to manage our next tour, which I think is is going to be hydrangea focused in in July. So um, now I'd like to introduce. Um, uh, so we'd like to. We have Annie, as I say, is not 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 with us. So we've got Claire uh, with us. Claire, I'm never sure whether you're Claire Greenslade or Claire Reed. I'm Claire Greenslade. Claire I like Greenslade. to swap it about. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, Claire is the head gardener at Hestercombe, uh, a venue in the southwest of England. We have done the occasional event there. Hestercombe is is a wonderful historic garden with a series of palimpsests of, of different historical periods, and it's also an art venue. And just a reminder that Claire and her colleague Tim uh, did do a webinar for us uh, on those connections between uh, contemporary art and the garden uh, about a, about a month or so ago, and that is available as one of our webinar recording so if you're interested in that whole interface between art and the garden that's actually a very interesting thing to to, to check out so uh we are garden masterclass we have a membership uh, which entitles you to discounts on our very extensive uh webinar recordings access to our archive of these events which must be kind of well in excess of 200 hours now um podcasts uh, for members only and various exclusive events um, and um, if you would just like to keep new to us and you'd just like to keep in touch, then do please sign up for our monthly newsletter, which is on the homepage of the website. And a little reminder that these events, Thursday Garden Chat, we do for free. Our presenters do for free. Uh, we do appreciate donations uh, to help keep, uh, keep us going and cover costs. And again, you can donate on the homepage of the website. Now, uh, time to introduce our speaker. Um, now, for those who are um, showing a bit of grey hair and have been around a bit, um, one of the really positive things that's happened in my professional career is this explosion of interest 
in native plants in the United States. Uh, my first visit to the US was in 1992. Uh, part of the reason for that trip was actually just was in fact researching the wildflower movement in the States, which was at the time pretty small. Um, and I think many of us have been quite astonished at, at the growth in this movement over the years. So it's always interesting to go back and visit those institutions that were there right at the beginning, were really pioneering in this remarkable movement. Now, a few months ago, we had Uli Lorimer from the Garden in the Woods uh, in, uh, in Massachusetts uh, doing a webinar. Um, and today we go to Texas um, to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, which was a, one of the real groundbreaking uh, institutions here. And we've got their director of horticulture, uh, Andrea, DeLong, uh, and, um, Andrea DeLong Amaya, um, who's, um, it's probably about, we're probably spoiling her lunch hour, I think. Um, so, um, Andrea, welcome. Um, and I think you've got quite a busy few days ahead of you. We do. Yeah, right now is the peak of uh, blue bonnet and wildflower season and Texans, but Americans lose their minds when blue bonnets are happening. And we just get inundated with uh, with tons of guests. And it's very uh, bustling outside. And it's, um, it's pretty fun to be out. And we're also <laughs> preparing for the eclipse, which we we're going to be hosting on Monday. So we have the typical blue bonnet group of uh, people coming out, plus uh, a lot of extra tours, people who are here in advance of the um, eclipse that are coming to check out the wildflowers in the wildflower center. Great. So, um, Andrea, uh, first of all, I think we need to have a little bit of, a bit of an introduction to Texas. Let's get beyond the stereotypes, which we all know about. Um, and um, I think in terms of, of, of flora, those of us who garden in, in, in Europe have been familiar with much of the North American flora for really quite a long time. And I'm talking kind of well over a, a century. And certainly over the last 20 years, there's been a, a revival of interest in these late flowering herbaceous plants. And we all know our Joe Pye weeds and our Rudbeckias and Helianthus and getting to know a few new genera like Venonias. But move south to Texas and it's all very different. So I thought we perhaps we should start off with just a little sort of highlight of um of of um um Tex having a look at Texas, looking what grows there, um, and a focus on some of the some of the wildflower species. So um can you all see the map of Texas? Looks good. Yeah. One thing that you'll notice, so we're looking at the ecoregions or vegetational areas of, of Texas. And uh, for the purposes of the Wildflower Center, our gardens here in Austin, uh, Austin, we're right about in the middle of the state um, where number seven, five and four converge. Um, that makes it really nice for us because we can reach into some of those other adjacent eco regions to borrow some of the plants that might be growing in those areas. Uh, but you'll also see that Texas is huge. <laughs> um, so, you know, when we're talking about native plants, uh, something that grows in East Texas would be very different conditions and tolerate different conditions than what we see in far West Texas, for example. Um, we were talking a little bit about the Texas blue bonnets right now, which are in peak. And I think you had a picture of that. Um, Texas blue bonnets uh, is a lupinus, uh, that genus. We have about six different species of lupinus in the state of Texas. This is lupinus texensis, and that one grows um, pretty much throughout the whole state. And um, all of the lupinus genus uh, species are known as our state wildflower, but this is the one that most people are familiar with. And isn't it lovely? I, there just really aren't very many plants that have that natural, really cobalt blue color to them. Um, and I it's funny, yes, people just go nuts about blue bonnets. And I think part of it is that when you see them growing, often you'll just see them in huge patches, um, acres, we, you know, oceans of blue bonnets. Um, and because they're the state flower of Texas. You know, there's some amount of patriotism for Texans here too. So they, there's a little bit of mystique with that. And would Texans, um, would some Texans grow that in their gardens or is it um, something that you see in nature? Both. Yeah, it's it's yeah. definitely a wildflower. Um, it's an annual that grows fairly easily in a garden setting. Um, just like other annuals. Uh, so it germinates for us here in the fall. Um, so people put the seeds out typically in the fall 
and then a good uh, a, a good fall winter rains that are well paced to keep the seedlings going um, is really going to be helpful for having a really stunning um, spring show, which is what we're having. <clears throat> excuse me, what we're having right now. We had good rains last fall and winter, and before then, last summer, um, as much of the world was experiencing crazy heat and drought. Um, Unfortunately, we lost a lot of plants, just the native plants just died out because it was too hot and dry uh, in the natural areas. But the silver lining on that is that opened up space for the uh, Texas blue bonnets and other wildflowers. So we're actually having a pretty remarkable year this year. Um, but yes, you can grow them in a garden and they grow through the winter and then they bloom in the spring. You let the seeds farm uh, and mature, which you know, they have kind of a rough look at that time. But uh, if you let the seeds mature before you pull the plants out, um, they'll drop and uh, continue uh, to grow the next fall. And they're, right. they're really nice contribution. Another one you chose was this uh, little capsicum. I love this plant. And people ask me, what's your favorite wildflower or native plant? And I hate that question because they're just too many, but I have to say this is probably one of my tops. Um, and it, this is uh, capsicum annuum. We call it chili piquin or bird pepper. It has a lot of different common names. And it um, it's perennial for us here in Austin. Further north, it's cold tender, but further south, it becomes a big shrub. Um, and it has this beautiful form to it. It's a very naturally rounded crown to it. Um, so it, as a plant, even though the flowers are pretty small and not showy, this photo doesn't have any pictures of the flowers, but they're tiny white. Um, even when they're not blooming, though, the plant is very attractive. And then you get these uh, green that turn into red fruits. And these are small. They're probably about the size of your pinky fin fingernail, but they pack a punch. Um, they're very spicy, and uh, I love to just go harvest a few, crush them up in a scrambled eggs or a pot of beans or something, anytime you want red pepper. Um, and what's nice about them is I don't bother to plant cultivated jalapenos anymore because this plant for me is perennial. It grows in sun and shade, uh, and it's just a really hardy plant. Um, it's also interesting. It's sort of the the prototype of um, so many of the peppers that we're familiar with, like the sweet bell peppers, even though they're sweet. This is the uh, same species that has been cultivated. Jalapenos, serranos, um, poblanos, all of those are capsicum annuum cultivars. So it has a nice history to it. Um, and then we got this extraordinary thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is sort of a menacing plant. Um, this is a, an annual that is native to the southwestern U.S., including Texas, um, and it's called Devil's Claw, and you can see why it's called that. The seed pod, when it matures, it gets hard and woody and splits open in half, and it has these curling um, uh, claws, which um, the seeds then are transported as the claws catch on the hoof of plants. I mean, of animals. It's all about plants, right? <laughs> they catch <laughs> on the hoof of animals uh, and then they get dragged around and then the seeds are dispersed that way. Uh, it's a great technique for the plant to get spread around, but not so great for the animals. Um, I've been stabbed by those and they're not pleasant. Um, so that's why they're called devil's claw. But there's also another interesting background. Um, do you have a picture of the flowers? On there too. Um, um, they, have, they have a very pretty orchid like flower to them. And so, as an ornamental plant in your garden, it's also nice. You just have to be careful about, um, you know, pets and, and other animals getting into it if the seed pods are um, mm -hmm. mature. Um, but it's an important plant for the um, southwestern US. The indigenous folks in different parts of this uh, country um, developed this plant to have um, longer spines um, and different qualities, different colored spines, because they're used for basket making. They're also a good food source. Um, I've eaten them. If you pick them, the seed pods, before they get hard and mature, they make uh, a very delicious vegetable, very similar to okra. Um, you can pickle them or do anything you would with an okra recipe, uh, and they're quite delicious. So they have a lot of uses to them. Oh, that's an interesting, right? One to, one to try out. Um, and now this, I, I, I just love this really sort of funky, the little buds. Um, Claire might know what you mean by iced gems, those little sweets. Yes, yes little, I know yes. exactly what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Do you have those American in the States? They were, like a, they, yeah. were like a little, they were like a tiny little biscuit with yeah. um, like a, a hard icing twirl on the top. 
they're like aimed at children, but they look just like this. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So this is <laughs> delicious. A, a, BPS, a milkweed. Yeah, this is one of our milkweeds called antelope horns because as milkweeds do, when the um, seed pods start to form, they also have the shape uh, like an antelope horn. And then they split open and spew out lots of silky strands uh, with seeds attached. And those silky strands are what um, carry the seeds in the wind to different locations to spread the plant. Um, but I am just also captivated by the flowers of these plants. Um, they're very intricate. Um, and I don't know if you can see, uh, there's a spider uh, in one of the flowers oh, in the yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. hiding, uh, ambushing somebody who's gonna come to take some nectar from the flower. Um, but this is a very popular plant with the um, bumblebees that we have around here. Sometimes butterflies will take nectar from it also. Um, and knowing that it's a, a milkweed, um, it's also an important food source for the caterpillars of the monarch butterflies. Also, we have queen butterflies in our area, which are related to the monarchs. Um, and those both both of those species use the milkweeds, uh, the whole genus of milkweeds um, of Asclepius as their larval food source. Uh, but this one just, I think, has a stunning flower to it. Yeah, it's yeah, fab, isn't it? Heat. Um, and then our final uh, focus on a, on a wildflower is going to be um, this clematis, which I uh, assume to be one of the, the Viorna section, which are quite trendy at the moment, aren't they? Um, mm -hmm. And I believe you call them leather flowers? Yeah. So this one we call purple leather flower. It's uh, uh, clematis pitcheri or clematis pitcheri. Um, and they're called leather flowers because if you feel um, that uh, what looks like a flower, it's very tough like leather. Um, and they're just this urn shape. It's kind of like a tulip that's facing downward. Um, but it's a beautiful vine and it's related to Clematis texensis, which I believe has been cultivated quite heavily in Europe, including uh, England, um, lots of different cultivars that um, that come out of that species. This one, I don't believe, has been cultivated quite as much, um, although it's pretty easy to grow for us here. Uh, and as you might be familiar with, not only are the flowers intriguing, but the uh, seed pods are crazy. They're kind of octopoid looking um, and they're not as showy, but they're just as interesting as the flowers. So I love that for that reason. And where does your um, love affair with plants come from? How 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 is how are you here? Right. <laughs> um, well, I grew up in a trailer park. I'm trailer trash, <laughs> uh, and. But the trailer park that I grew up on in was in Michigan and we were surrounded by woods and the woods, nature was my nanny. You know, I spent my time playing in the woods with my friends or not. Um, you know, instead of Barbie dolls, I played with sticks and rocks. I know, kind of a nerd, <laughs> but um, that was super fun for me. And I just had this connection to the natural world that was just powerful for me from the beginning. Um, and my dad would take me camping and, you know, I did other things like that too, but um yeah, I just knew that I wanted to do something with nature. And by chance, when I was in college, I got a job at a, working for um, a plant nursery. And we specialized in native plants. And I was studying geography with a focus on ecology. Um, and so those two things converged, which is why I'm particularly interested in growing native plants as opposed to other things too. Although I have my pets, I have lots of antique roses and I love them very much too. <laughs> um, but I, uh, I am just drawn to native plants, partly because of their beauty, but also, you know, there's still a lot of native plants that are just not well known horticulturally and are very worthy. And I want to expose people to how wonderful they are. And um, there are a lot of reasons why native plants are important, which I can slide into that right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and I would be curious to hear y'all's take on that too, um, because I, I had spent some time in England and I realized that your concept of native plant might be similar, but it, there's a lot different context that you have than what we have. I think for us in the US, um, the concept of native plant is a little bit more important perhaps. Um, we are trying to avoid invasive species which take over and become very destructive uh, on an ecological scale. So using native plants uh, helps us avoid that. But also with 
climate change and just resource conservation in general, people are really drawn to native plants because they take uh, less water. If you cite the correct plant to the site that you have, um, they're going to be a lot less resource intensive. You can get away with doing less soil amendments or maybe none if you get the right plant in the right place. Um, you can kind of blur the lines between ecological restoration and gardening, which Really, re restoration is kind of a form of gardening on a larger scale using different tools, but it's still, you know, it's still cultivating plants in a way. Um, I also think that it's important when you're looking at native plants that uh, we're really focusing on enhancing our regional identity and celebrating that. And I think that's one of the things that really connects with me that Mrs. Johnson had a quote, and I don't have the exact quote, but her her uh, point was that she wanted New Hampshire to look like New Hampshire and Texas to look like Texas. And, you know, if you go to kind of just about any gas station in the United States, you'll see red tip photinias and boxwoods and San Augustine grass, and you could be anywhere in the country. And it really doesn't tell you much about, you know, your local region. And um, that whole homogenization of the American landscape is just a very sad thing. And, uh, mm -hmm. So part of it for me is trying to preserve, <clears throat> trying to preserve that heritage, that natural heritage, and connecting with the natural world in general. I think yeah, the sure. more we can see stuff in the growing in the wild, we can connect with it. Yeah. Yes. So you know, you mentioned Mrs. Johnson there. So who was Lady Bird Johnson? Lady Bird Johnson was our founder. Um, that's the importance to us. Um, she founded the Wildflower Center with her friend and actress Helen Hayes. Uh, in 1987, excuse me, um, on her 70th birthday, which I think is very inspirational. Um, before that, her career was as a, um, the U.S. Uh, First Lady um, with President Johnson. Um, they were in the White House in the 60s, and um, she was known at that point for her work with beautification, uh, beautification of the highways, um, she was very instrumental in uh, limiting the amount of um, billboards that were on the highways and cleaning up trash. Um, but significantly, she also um, really put a priority on um, planting wildflowers and working with the local departments of transportation to limit the amount of mowing and scheduling the mowing so that it would be um, supporting the uh, native plants there. So that was where she really started her um, reputation as the environmental first lady. And um, that term environmentalist was not really even a commonly used term at that point. And so um, she was really a visionary. She really was on the cutting edge of, of doing that kind of work. And it's funny, she uh, is known for the term beautification, which she recognized was sort of a prissy term, she called it. Um, she didn't really like the word. She thought it was more important than what that gave it credit for, but understood that that was a word that would connect with people. So uh, it goes way back to uh, that beautification. I think we're all, um, it sounds like it's this, the same way you are as, as here in that we're all um, missing a link somewhere with our connections with nature and that's why these places and gardens and, and naturalization is I guess so important so we um, I went to a garden masterclass recently um, where we had a talk from um, at Yo Valley we had to talk from a, a, a Japanese gardener and she talked about how they celebrate you know um, her ancestors celebrated 72 seasons and in the room of English people, the English people were saying, oh, it's such a shame we don't have this lovely thing. And, and I think, well, we did. We had like paganism. We had witches. We had these wise women that used these plants. And I'm guessing it's the same in Texas as well. There's been a sort of um, we've we've made ourselves remote from nature. And now we're, we're all so keen to get it back. I think it's really good work that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting dynamic that's happened. I think it was happening here before the pandemic, but since the pandemic, I feel like it's really hit even more that people are interested in gardening and growing their own food and uh, understanding what native food plants might be out there for wild harvesting. And it's pretty interesting and, and exciting to see what that, that that kind of momentum. Yeah, it's really good. So with the images here, we can uh, see some uh, vignettes of the garden at the centre. Uh, so this is obviously a place to visit. Uh, but could you say something about what the what the mission of the centre is and your various other activities? Yeah, our mission is inspiring the conservation of native plants. And when we talk about native plants, uh, you know, everybody has a different idea of what that means. And I would say that a good shorthand is just a plant that occurs in a given area um, 
without human introduction. And so um, that gets a little tricky because we've been around so long that we know that there's evidence that Native Americans were moving plants around. Um, and then when Europeans came, there was a huge influx of uh, of new plants that came in from the old world. And so that's often a time that we talk about, you know, plants that were here before Columbus, for example, um, so it's kind of a little bit messy, but I think that's a pretty reasonable shorthand to use. Um, and then our gardens uh, are all plants that are native to the state of Texas. And we are in central Texas, so we focus on plants that are uh, in our region, but then we also reach into um, other parts of the state as well, just to broaden our horizons. And um, we also are demonstrating these plants to people who may be coming from other parts of the state as well. Uh, so we are not using bedding plants and we're not using um, non-native species on purpose, although <clears throat> the things that we consider weeds are those that are not native <laughs> to our state. <laughs> so I love to just see, you know, all, I'm looking at these pictures and just all the beautiful textures and forms. And um, I really want uh, the gardens to inspire people to, um, you know, hook them into seeing how beautiful native plants are. There's sort of this myth that native plants have to look messy or unkempt or wild, and they certainly can be. And I think a lot of gardeners who appreciate native plants have that aesthetic, that they don't want to be too heavy handed. But I think they also lend themselves very well to um, a more cultivated kind of garden as well. And, and I don't want that to be a reason people wouldn't use native plants because it's not the plants themselves that dictate the kind of style of a garden. It's how you design it and how you maintain it um, that really is going to give you that style. How many, how many people do you have working uh, uh, with the plants? In the horticulture department, um, we have about a dozen of us. And that includes uh, three people who are working in our nursery doing um, growing and some research projects. And then we have um, another hand, the rest of the folks are working in the gardens themselves. And then we also have tons of volunteers that help us out. We could not keep afloat without the help of our wonderful volunteers. Mm. And um, you have a research program there. Could you talk us through like how that works and how they're all incorporated? Well, it starts way back with uh, Mrs. Johnson's vision to do research. We started actually as the National Wildflower Research Center and then lady, later changed our name to honor Mrs. Johnson. Um, so research has been in our background since the beginning. Um, currently, some of the projects that, well, one of the projects that we've been working on for the last 23 years um, is a long-term management study on our property here where we're doing um, different kinds of land management techniques and then we're monitoring the vegetation to see how those different techniques shift the vegetation. So that can give us guidance as to um, if you burn in the summer or if you mow in the winter or if you do nothing, how does that uh, affect the vegetation? So that's a, an interesting project that we've been working on. And I believe it's the longest running study of that type uh, in the United States. Um, we're also doing some research that's just pretty new. We just started working on it um, uh, as part of an international ecological monitoring network um, where we have replicated that uh, those experiments and we're measuring the effects of drought, land clearing, um, nutrient, nutrient addition to see how that affects pollinators and the vegetation and hopefully give us some guidance too on um, how those types of things will influence uh, the eco region um, with climate change as well. So you, you mentioned the the, the nursery. Um, so I was just wondering what the commercial availability of a lot of Texas natives is, because although there's been this amazing movement towards commercialization of, of native species in, in the United States, one rather has the impression it's very, very dominated by that perhaps more northeasterly or midwestern flora. Um, and um, so, so I imagine that, that perhaps the, the South is a bit of a sort of game of, of, of catch up in on, on this level. Yeah, it is interesting. I, I wish that native plants were more available, but they are always, they are becoming more and more available all the time. Um, and that's one of the roles that we see playing here is um, sort of priming the pump, if you will, to getting people excited about using native plants. And then, as you mentioned, our nursery, we are growing a lot of native species that we sell. Uh, we have a a four or five week plant sale each spring and again in the fall, and then a smaller um, tree and woody plant sale in, um, in January. So we're trying to make a lot of these things more available to folks. Um, 
And uh, yeah, there's, I, I think that we've experienced some pretty severe weather in the last few years, um, including a couple years of severe cold and freezing long-term, um, you know, long weeks, <laughs> uh, or days rather of extreme cold, which is unusual for us. And then we had last summer, this really hot, dry summer and lost a lot of plants. And I think people are recognizing that the plants that survived the best were the native plants. And so I think that's made a big influence on people's um, interest in the demand for native plants in our area. There's only how much is available as seed mixtures, um, because in certainly for some habitats, it's more, you know, you can achieve a lot more with a seed mixture than than, than buying plants. Uh, and there's been quite a kind of vehicle um me, I know you're interested in, in the whole native plant seed in Britain, but that has largely been about meadow mixes, about mixes of species that are appropriate for particular soil. So, you know, how much can be done with 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 with, with seed? I think a lot. Yeah, it's it's certainly more economical if you have a large area to grow plants from seeds. Um, and if you're doing a meadow kind of situation, then it totally makes sense to to start from seed. Um, it's a little tricky here. We get a lot of weed invasion. Um, if you're trying to grow a wildflower meadow, it sounds easy. And um, if you're starting with a fairly undisturbed site and you're enhancing it with new species or maybe species that, um, you know, we have a lot of history with goats and cattle. Uh, if you had goats or deer or cattle that ate out certain species and then you've eliminated them from your landscape, then reseeding them is a great way to uh, improve that habitat again. Um, so that's definitely a good way to do it. Uh, but even on a small scale, this is in our gardens here, this picture with the drum and fly which I think you guys use a lot of too. Um, mm. German phlox was a, one of the coreopsis. Um, you know, they grow really easily. A lot of these spring blooming annuals. We also have fall blooming annuals too that that do pretty easily from seed. And it's um, economical. It's certainly easier than digging holes and spending a lot of money on that. So a good way to do it. It's so, these are such beautiful images. It'd be it's really interesting to try I don't know if you're doing this in your head Noel I'm trying to picture this with our natives and how how you would garden it um I've always really wanted to make a weed garden at Hestercombe to celebrate our weeds and but I it would be it's always think it would be impossible to make something this beautiful but there this is stunning no oh, thank you I'm uh, curious well, to maybe. what your ideas are of, of what a weed is, because that, that's such well, a that's it. But it's <laughs> the native plants to us, aren't they? It's it, you know we today we've I've been weeding celandine out of a bed, and it, it's there's a question of like how whether you should or shouldn't. You know, it's such a beautiful little plant; it'll just disappear. Everything you know, and a lot of it is just our traditional views of gardening. Is and that's what's so mind blowing about looking at these. It's that kind of blowing it out of the water. I'm um, right. Claire, I'm amazed that you would waste your time weeding out the left of Thelanda, which I think is one of the most <laughs> misunderstood, uh, unfair, totally demonized plants in the British flora. I, uh, I mean, it's it's a spring ephemeral. I mean, by May, it'll, it'll have completely it'll disappeared. It'll have gone. Yeah, exactly. Um, personally, I think they look wonderful alongside a lot of bulbs. They're far less competitive than bluebells, which, um, in fact, our speaker last week was complaining about bluebells, um, saying that they suppress, you know, anemones and all the other smaller native species and that in their garden in Kent, but they just have to accept other bluebells have taken over. But, I mean, Lesser Celandine is, is nothing like as competitive so. <laughs> Yeah, and it does just disappear, doesn't it? That's the thing. It's yeah. just it's just interesting our concept of um a, a weeds, native plants, garden plants, and and where they all meet in the middle is perfection in a way, isn't it? I, I think of weeds as being a plant that is growing where you don't want them. So even our beloved blue bonnet can be a weed if it's growing in with something we don't want it. So it's it's uh, selective editing. Yeah, yeah. You've designed with native plants or weeds. So it's <laughs> like working out what goes where, isn't it? Right. It's because the flora, I can't remember the figures, uh, but the the British flora for flowering plant species is around about 1,500. And I think in Texas, it's twice or even three times that. Uh, you know, this is a very rich flora. 
Mm. Uh, and a very varied one, and you know, as we're appreciating, a very colourful one. Uh, so you know, you 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 guys have got an awful lot more to play with. Uh, yes, we we are lucky that way. I think there's a little bit happening with the geography too, because mm. we're uh, if you can imagine the North American continent as it funnels into South America, so Central America is a pinch point there, and so there's that gradient. Uh, you know, the plants and animals kind of funnel down that um, that um, that tight point where Texas is and into Mexico. And so we're getting that um, that diversity coming through. And then we have the diversity of East and West and North and South um, uh, being right kind of in the middle of the country, uh, East and West. Anyway, we have a lot of diversity for sure. Yeah, yeah, yes. I'm sure a lot of that diversity, I'm sure there's a lot of good species out there that are deserving of cultivation and are not yet um, in cultivation. Um, and in some cases, I know that's because they are they have particular requirements. But in other cases, they think I think things are just can be astonishingly um, o- o- overlooked. Yeah, and it's just a matter of time too. You know, I wish that we had more time to experiment and test out different species that we haven't really played with yet. That you know, just seeing them, they look like they have some good potential. Um, mm. so there's always more stuff to explore. <laughs> I'm gonna. I, that's what I was gonna ask. What's the What's the future for the ladybird Johnson? What, what you know? What how, do you have plans going forward? Well, to continue what we're doing, uh, yes, definitely <laughs> trying to expand, um, making more native plants available, developing our collections a little bit more, um, getting um, certified collections. So we're actually um, working on getting uh, several collections certified. Um, We have the very beginnings of a fern collection, a fernery um, with Texas ferns. Interestingly, people think of ferns as being woodland species that grow in, you know, moist woods. Um, But we actually have more species diversity in West Texas, the xerophytic plants that grow in full sun and dry conditions. Um, You think of things like resurrection fern. Um, so we have more diversity. There's probably more biomass in the wet, wetter, woodsy areas. So anyway, that's a pretty fun one to play with the fern collection. We also have a very strong collection of oaks. Um, we have uh, 73% of all of the oak species in the United States occur in Texas. Um, so that's another low hanging fruit for us that we're working on. And then hopefully more cactus, uh, doing a cactus collection. Um, we are getting ready to do a comprehensive master plan, which will allow us to reevaluate our garden exhibits and think of new new garden exhibits that we want to have available um, and constantly improving what we're doing. I mean, I, I sort of said it a minute ago, but I wanted to just reiterate. I think one of the important things for me is to show to our guests that native plants can be used in beautiful, naturalistic looking gardens, but also in very stylized or formal looking gardens as well. Um, it yes, certainly looks like what impact that. you're making actually on the domestic garden. Um, somebody, I think it was probably Rebecca McMacken, sent me something just a couple of weeks ago, which was a, a survey of uh, consumers in, uh, in for, for gardening and, and finding out there was a really quite astonishingly high proportion of people buying plants in garden centres were, were very positive or, or prioritizing buying native plants. And I think it really rather surprised the organizers of the survey. Um, but I was wondering how that, that works out, you know, with a more distinctively regional flora I and mean, how much Im- impact you think you're making on, on those, on those, on those lawns, those terrible lawns. That are... <laughs> uh, it is interesting. It's fun to walk around town uh, or drive around town in Austin and just see, plants that I know that we introduced, uh, that's pretty gratifying, you know, like nobody else grows golden groundsel, you know, 20 years ago. And so if you have that, you've got it at the Wildflower Center. So uh, mm-hmm. yeah, that's a lot of fun. Um, what's tricky though, is some of our plants are dormant. Like um, we have um, a, ren- a native ranunculus and we have a Tradescantia spiderwort. Those are two examples of great species that are uh, evergreen in the winter and then they bloom in the spring but then they go completely dormant in the summer so if you're a, a growing plants in a nursery setting you're looking at a pot that's empty and how do you sell that and how do you keep your crew from not just dumping it out because they've assumed it's died <laughs> you know so there's some weird little challenges there too but mm-hmm. um yeah there's it's i'm seeing more native plants available for sure yeah 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 and and to so go back to one of uh, mrs johnson's real concerns that the, the highways um i've just pulled off my bookshelf the delaware department of transportation's 
roadside vegetation concept and planning manual. Um, right, with Bonnie Harper Laurie. Is that that book? Um, it was, I think, it was Rick Dark. I think it was a Rick Dark. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, Rick Dark. Written, yes, yeah, there's, there's a team of four, but Rick was um, one, of the, one of the key people. I mean, how how, uh, how is that program? Um, no doubt it varies enormously from one state to another, but I mean, how how is it on the whole generally doing these days? Um, I don't, the Wildfire Center, we're not really involved with the Texas Department of Transportation no. um, with their um, wild uh, wildflower program. Um, we do struggle that, you know, some areas, the the local people, um, it's usually counties, I think, that organize when the mowing mm -hmm. happens. And um, sometimes the mowers come out on contract on a schedule and it doesn't matter if they're in full bloom or not, and they'll just mow them down. And yeah, it's unfortunate, yeah. but, you know, it's mixed because then you'll see other areas that are just spectacular and managed very well. So, yeah. Are there any other centers like this across other states or are you quite unique? Uh, there are not very many native plant gardens. There are lots of gardens that have native plant gardens within them, but um, very few that are fully focused on uh, native species. Uh, Garden in the Woods, I think, is one of them that mm. that uh, does. This is the devil's claw, the flowers that look like orchids. Oh, wow. Yes. So those mean claws are attached to these beautiful flowers. <laughs> I love uh, that. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> and they smell really good too. Um, uh, so yeah, I think Garden of the Woods also um, uh, in Santa Barbara Botanic Gardens in California is another one. And I think there are a couple others too, but it's not, like I said, it's usually um, a smaller garden within a larger public garden that, that does native plants. I think it's been a very positive step, all of these public gardens. And I think it's one of the things that mm. the United States does supremely well of these public gardens uh, that they nearly all now you know feel they have to have a native plant garden that they you know that that's the uh the expectation is very much there that you know something is is done and it's sort of contextualized within that that wider context which perhaps in some ways perhaps gets gets more people through the through the doors and getting getting interest certainly and i i do think that um climate change is driving some of that as well and people just it's getting more and more ridiculous to just pour potable water on your landscape. And so if you can grow plants that are better adapted, um, that's a more reasonable use of, of resources. It's certainly, from my point of view, it's very interesting working in a historic garden where we're following planting plans from the 1750s or from 1904. Um, which obviously like the climate's changed for, you know, in the 20 years I've been here, the climate's changed a ridiculous amount. So, um, tr you know, trying to figure out where you can move and still keep the concept of the garden and still keep the, you know, like really we have a Victorian bedding scheme. If I was being true to the environment, I would skip that about something else. In, but if you're being true to history, you want to be able to show it. So it's, it is really, in we're going to have so many interesting conversations about climate and plants that are available to us and, and how we manage things. Interesting mm, that's a fun conundrum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. Yes, it's good. And how long have you worked at, at here? Uh, I've worked at the Wildflower Center since the 1900s. <laughs> so it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh it's I just passed my 25 year anniversary here in December so oh, I don't understand funny. how the math works I you know it kind of blows my mind like was I 12 when I started working here I don't understand <laughs> how that happened but here we are and it's 2024 <laughs> that's great you need those long-term people though to see because you you have seen seasons change you have seen climate change whilst you've been there so it's it's really it's really important to have that value of someone being in a place for a long time, that connection. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. We were talking about climate change or global warming back in the 70s. Yeah. Yes. Now yeah. we're seeing it. And that really happening. Yes. Yes. Um, so in terms of your garden visitors and volunteers, I mean, inevitably, so many of these uh, institutions are very much dominated by the kind of white middle classes. Um, now, what have you been able have you been able to do uh, about um, you know, getting a, a, a more diverse demographic? Well, in Austin, we do have a pretty good um, percentage of uh, Hispanics and Latinas that that live in Austin and um 
and come through as tourists as well. And because of that, we do have language, uh, Spanish language on our signage and trying to make that a little bit easier um, for folks who don't speak English to come in and appreciate the gardens. But, you know, especially this time of year, you'll hear all different languages uh, spoken and that's pretty pretty fun to see people from all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's very good. Uh, now we've got a question that's come in about, um, well, actually, in, uh, Ulla in Germany, uh, beauty in Middle European vegetation more or less ends in July, August. Uh, do do you have a seasonal end in in flowering, uh, or do you manage to keep things going pretty well all through the summer into the autumn? That's an interesting question. Um, we have a fairly mild climate, and so we garden year round. Um, we're planting a lot in the fall and winter, even into spring with the hopes that plants will get established before the brutal summer hits, because that's really our extreme, our most extreme time of year. Um, and if we have a warm spell in the wintertime, we'll have flowers too, uh, even with the native plants. You can also cultivate um, non-native plants that will bloom through this uh, winter as well. Um, there was a this concept that I'm that we use here at the Wildflower Center that uh, that I call time sharing. And that's where you have a couple species growing together in the same location, but they express themselves at different times of the year. So for example, this time of year, we have some um, big patches of spiderworts and then they go completely dormant in the summertime. You know, they're blooming now, then they disappear. That's one of the ones I mentioned that, you know, there's no, no stems or anything visible. It's all underground in the summer. And then we combine that with um, wax mallow and that's a plant that grows through the summer and blooms all summer and into the fall, and then it freezes back. And so when it's um, when it's done, we cut it to the ground, and then the spiderworts are starting to come back. So that's a way to maximize the use of your space, keeping it looking interesting, and and uh, increasing the habitat value for pollinators and uh, other creatures as well. Um, so that's one way that we manage that. But yes, we are year round. I would say spring and fall are the most uh, floriferous for us. Um, summer is hot and dry, although some things will continue to bloom through the summer, especially if we get rain. Um, and then mm. winter, we tend to have, you know, a lot of green plants, but uh, a little bit of flowering here too. Would you ever, do you ever water plants if it gets too hot? A what plant? Do you ever water plants? Yeah, your, like your irrigation policy, that would be interesting to yeah. hear about. Yes, yes. So we do irrigate our gardens when we have a dry spell. Um, some gardens don't get irrigated at all, and others get irrigated more than others. But uh, it, we want the plants, the gardens to look good for, for our guests to come see. So we do have that. Pre we don't want to just have a bunch of brown plants that <laughs> they might survive, you know, because they're drought resistant. They may survive, but not look as great as we would like. Well, that, that is a it's a sort of almost like a catch-22, I think, for public <laughs> gardens. On the one hand, you want to educate people about irrigation, but yeah. on the other hand, you know, you've got to keep people coming through the door and you've got to show show off what you're growing. And I really appreciate that is quite a, quite a, quite a, quite a, must be quite a difficult one. Yeah, so we do a little of each. <laughs> That's the way yeah. we do it. Oh, yes, one. yes. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. So it's all a balance, isn't it? Such a, such a big balancing act. And do you and do you have lots of um, family activities and do you have like um, education school groups coming? It must be brilliant for schools to come there. It is. Yeah, it's super fun. Like, again, when it's this time of year, well, when school's in session, we have uh, lots of school groups come through and it's just, you know, the, the energy of the little kids running around is just <laughs> pretty fun. <laughs> it's very encouraging. Um, so, yeah, we do uh, obviously programs for children and youth. Um, we have uh, classes for adults and gardening and garden related, nature related um, topics. Um, we also host uh, professional symposia and conferences as well. Um, so it's a wide range of, of things. Our, our website has a lot of information on uh, mm -hmm. too. So um, I encourage people to check that out. And I'm, um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> yeah, well, in fact, you do have a database on the website, don't you, which is, I must say, extremely useful. Um, I've been trying to, trying to sort of well, find out about 
the wild habitat of a lot of the Native American stuff we use in 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 horticulture generally, um, and it can be quite difficult to find references to to habitat. So that's 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 how I discovered your your database actually a few couple of months ago. So you know, it is a, very it is, powerful. It is a very useful one for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I use it a lot too. It's great for images um, mm -hmm. and helping with identifying plants as well. Yeah. It's a, it's a very good website. I, I would have, I'd say to everyone that's watching this, go and look at the website. It's a good. Well, one. yes, do yes. There's a lot on, and you, and you get a real sense of the sheer scope uh, and ambition of, of what the centre does. Um, we've got a question. Um, curious, what your take on regenerative agriculture is in regarding to well to, to wildflower habitat. Um, I don't know. This is this term regenerative agriculture it may not be a term that's used much in the US. Um, yeah, I'm not really that no, familiar with that. Yeah, no, no, no. I think well, it's um, well, it's about restoring soil quality essentially mm. after intensive um, production. Um, yep. Yeah, um, I mean, I can speak on a on a small residential scale, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, one of our gardens uh, at the Wildflower Center, we call it the Taste of Place, and it's yeah. a collection of plants that are native to Texas that have some parts of them that are edible, and many of them, most of them are perennials, which is nice, and right. I have this imagine, you know, you can plant a whole garden uh, with beautiful plants, and they just happen to be edible, you know, whether yeah. it's the leaves or flowers or roots or whatever parts of it, um, so that's one way you can do something uh, on a smaller residential scale. And that's a very very interesting thought. I mean, it's something that um, I mean, so as you say, so many of the plants we grow are actually edible, um, and in fact, in some cases, are quite important. Just thinking of daylilies uh, eaten in. I mean, you could apparently eat any part of a hemorrhagalis plant, <laughs> um, um, uh, but uh, no, the it's the the, the buds that are eaten in 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 China, and you, you can buy bags of these dry. Um, daily buds in Chinese food shops. Um, but no, I think that's that's a very interesting topic. And the sheer uh, sustainability of having perennial food sources as opposed to annual ones uh, is a really major consideration. I, I kind of feel we've hardly even begun to scratch the surface there. Mm, that's true. It'd be, be nice to see a, you know, traditional uh, but perennial veg garden, wouldn't it? Yeah, yes, yes. It is pretty cool to just walk out your front or back door and just start eating your garden. <laughs> it's just, yes. it's wonderful to be able to do that. <laughs> and there's a lot to be said about um, um, eating weeds. Yes. Natives. So, so we have a Japanese knotweed problem in, in, a, in a lot of areas in the UK and actually it's all edible. We should just eat it away. <laughs> Eat it away. Well, yes, <laughs> I, 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 I think yeah. the, the Japanese not with them. It's good at the tips, stir for any flash fried in a wok and a dash of soy sauce. They're really nice. Yeah. Um, and in fact, if you go online, you can find quite a lot of recipes for Japanese knotweed because it's quite acidic. So it's it could be it's a good rhubarb uh, hmm. stand. Um, but the trouble is, once you give something an economic value or a culinary value, then people won't drive it to extinction yeah. uh, and i think the same was said about trying to promote the eating of gray squirrels because one of our real wildlife <laughs> andrea is the american gray squirrel which was introduced by some idiot aristocrat in the mid 90s yeah. and the gray squirrels are basically they're incredibly destructive to our woodlands and the the populations we have indulged in this kind of psychotic behavior sort of ripping bark off young trees they've also more or less eliminated the red squirrel um, and it's been suggested oh, they taste just like chicken. You get people to shoot them and eat them. And the trouble is then people wouldn't want to get rid of them. Um, <laughs> so it's uh, it's a two-edged sword, that one. But uh, Well, no. I'll let you into a secret. We have a member of my team who looks after the squirrels and uh, oh, yes. he eats quite well on them. <laughs> oh, really? Right, okay. um, has it, it's not appeared in the restaurant yet. It's not yet. Not squirrel. yet. Has to come squirrel <laughs> That would take some education, wouldn't it? Yeah, somebody calls them squirrel, uh, the squirrel's tree rats, which is very, um, they are rodents for sure. Yeah. What's your greatest um, pest in the garden? What's, what's the hardest thing to, to deal with? Uh, we have a deer problem. 
Mm. Yeah, deer. We also have armadillos, which are pretty cool creatures. Uh, I mean, when you think of an animal, animal from Texas, armadillos are pretty iconic, but they're also very destructive, even though they're awfully cute. Well, actually, deer are beautiful, too, but they're also very destructive. And the rabbits, they eat stuff, too. So I'm looking for a good Haas and Pfeffer recipe. <laughs> <laughs> You're not, you're not allowed to say that, are you? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and one question again from Ulla. What about the average knowledge of people about wildflower vegetation? Uh, I mean, is this... Um, um, I mean, you mentioned about how Texas blue bonnets are, are, are seen as a kind of symbol of the state. I mean, is this uh, appreciation perhaps transferring to uh, other species as well? Yeah, I think a lot of people are familiar. You know, this time of year, there's a lot of um, big fields of wildflowers and mm -hmm. a lot of folks will just go out for a, a weekend drive and, and go botanizing. Um, nice. I just did that last weekend and it's it's pretty fun to see. There's just, you know, there's blue bonnets and they're, they're paintbrushes, but there's a lot of other very interesting things happening right now. You know, mm -hmm. getting out of your car and going to a park or roadsides and looking mm -hmm. around and, and just exploring is pretty fun right now. So paintbrushes, that's Castilea. Uh, yes. How do you, I'm never sure how, how do you pronounce that? Castileja or Castilea? Or... I say Castilea, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, we have several species, but that's... They're, they're, yeah. they're semi-parasitic, aren't they? They are. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they the do photosynthesis. Really, does that mean they're really difficult to grow? Yes. I mean, I don't know anybody who can cultivate them in a garden setting. If you have them, you're lucky, and then you know they grow very easily. But, mm. um, but yeah, they will host. They, they photosynthesize, but they also host on grasses and other plants too. Because so, one of the really great, quite straightforward successes in British wildflowers has been uh, we have with one semi-parasite which is related to Castanea. It's it's a yellow rattle, particularis. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is now very extensively used to so it weakens the grasses and over a number of years you can really build up amazing wildflower diversity because the grass is being knocked back preferentially by by the yellow rattle um and um and then james mm -hmm. hitch sheffield university had one of his army of um postgraduate students doing doing work on Castilea, I think, but I'm not sure what, what came out of it. So presumably Castilea's, you can't just kind of sow the seed and and they they obviously, it's a bit more difficult perhaps. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. seed is tiny little dust. It's like flour. Oh, oh dear. Oh, really yellow tiny. rattle seed is nice, big, chunky stuff. It's the kind of thing <laughs> you, know, you you want to collect it, you you know, send the grandchildren out and don't don't, don't let them back in until they've you know collected half a bag and stuff. <laughs> Bring me back really for... it's very easy to collect. Oh, I see. Yes, interesting. Um and do you do you collect all the seed from your gardens? Do you do you keep <laughs> keep the species going? We do, yeah. Um, uh, we do collect seed that we use to grow in our nursery that we then use to either grow plants back to put back in the gardens or or put in different locations in the gardens or for our plant sales. Um, we also, one of our plant conservation programs is our seed bank. We started, um, well, it's probably been over 20 years ago now that we started uh, doing collections with the Millennium Seed Bank project uh, that was started by Q. Um, so we do collect for that as well. Oh, that's fab. Right. So, um, nearly seven o'clock. So, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, now, I mentioned before, we hadn't, God Masterclass has not been to Texas before. In fact, God Masterclass has, has spent shamefully little in the American South all round, which is a situation we're trying to remedy. And indeed, we're coming back to Texas next month to meet the Texas Master Gardeners. Um, so um, we will be back. And um, thank you very much, Andrea. That was uh, really interesting. Uh, Super great fun to talk with you guys. More about this, this great institution and um, hear about your role in it. Thank Those you. Those images were beautiful. Thanks for, thanks <laughs> for the images. They were great. Take care, y'all. Bye.